So why clinical pharmacology when you got to pick <laughs> what specialty you wanted to do? As a pediatrician, it was an area that's that's really developing within pediatrics and sort of quite an exciting area that's sort of expanding sort of at the moment in terms of the research opportunities and the um, the opportunities to do sort of uh, novel uh, research in pediatrics is is sort of what what interested me in clinical pharmacology. So Vincent White. Mm, and for myself, really, it's that clinical pharmacology is a very broad subject because there's no specialty in medicine, whether it's cardiology or respiratory, where they don't use drugs. And obviously, clinical pharmacology is the study and the, the usage of drugs you know, more efficiently. So that's what interested me, the fact that it was very broad and you could do lots of different areas of research. Do you have a specific area of research that you're interested in already? Yeah, so with my particular PhD project, I look at drug hypersensitivity reactions. So I look at why people get skin rashes to drugs. And more specifically for my PhD, I'm looking at carbamazepine hypersensitivity. So carbamazepine is an anti-epileptic drug. It's very effective, but one in 10 people do get a drug rash. So at the moment, we do know some things about these reactions. We know that they're based on the immune system. We know that there's a genetic component, but we don't know, you know what brings it all together. So my research is aiming at trying to solve some of, some of that problem. Very interesting. All right, so Lauren, why clinical pharmacology? My first job was our, we have an inpatient clinical pharmacology ward uh, um, in Liverpool. And so my, it was sort of my first job. And I think that kind of gave me exposure to a lot of the, the, the kind of the way the registrar training works is that they have periods of time where they're off the ward do, that's dedicated to research. And we have someone who ha does cardiovascular research, respiratory, gastro. Um, so there was, I sort of saw that, that there was quite a lot of ways that you could develop a particular specialist interest but keep your general medical um, interest as well and I quite liked that combination so I did the um, academic clinical fellowship in clinical pharmacology and neurology which was my organ based specialty but I, I never really wanted to be a neurologist because I like general medicine too much so I didn't want to give that up so um, so my research interest that sort of developed from there so I look at um, patients with drug resistant epilepsy and patient sort of stratification uh, using novel biomarkers and I look at trying to predict um, when people present early with their sort of first seizure whether or not they're likely to a develop epilepsy and b whether or not that's going to be a drug resistant phenotype based on, on, on novel blood tests really and then whether we can use the, the biomarkers themselves, the sort of mechanistic biomarkers as a way to develop new, uh, as drug targets really, so new sort of immunomodulatory drugs because there's a theory that it's um, in some individuals it's inflammation that contributes to the development of their drug resistance. One of the things that, that's always interested me about epilepsy and epilepsy research is that it has such a massive impact on pe people's lives. It, you know, you can have what would sound to some people like quite insignificant seizures in some way. I had a a chap who's who had daily seizures and it just manifest as aphasia. So he just he just couldn't speak for several minutes. But he was a teacher, and 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 it was impossible for him to do his job because it was happening every day. And it, and it seems like a small thing that you think we well, that, that's not so bad. But if you've had 15 years where you were stable on your drugs and and you were driving and 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 there was no problem, and then out of nowhere this happens and nobody can explain to you why that's happened. You know, I think that, that that's dreadful. You know, it's a dreadful situation to be in. So. All right, so I'm gonna um, shift gears a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about BJCP. So BJCP, have you published in BJCP? No, no not yet, no. Not, not yet, yet. <laughs> right? <laughs> not yet. So do you read BJCP? Yes, yeah. So could you give me a, a, an article perhaps that you read in the last year or so that you thought was, that was really good, that really helped you? I think I read it more now than I had done previously because I signed up to get the, the sort of the weekly, the kind of the update, um, the, the table of the contents. Email, the yeah, table so, of content and alert. I think that, that helps and it was sort of a shame to say, but I only recently kind of discovered the thing with PubMed where you can save a search and then they send you weekly updates. So I've started doing that a lot more now, I think since I became a full-time researcher doing the PhD. So. Um, but yeah, so I, I have started to read it a lot more, and I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed in the last sort of twelve months the, the way that, that there's been the sort of special editions. So it, particular interest to me, there was the uh, special edition back in August on the on biologics, um, mainly because my my research interest sort of surrounds inflammation and, and development of immunomodulators. But we also um, work as study physicians. We have a, a, a phase one accredited clinical trials unit. So we're doing quite a lot of early phase kind of clinical trials. So the, the issue was relating to um, regulatory 
kind of perspectives on on tr trials using biologics and in particular whether you sh whether we should be using uh, health uh, testing just doing that sort of early phase safety in healthy volunteers or in patients so I thought that was really interesting and then also there was a, another sort of section about kind of advanced um, biologic therapy so looking at stem cells and and kind of the more genetic um, therapies and things which I, which I found really interesting because it's quite hard to get that information about what the sort of regulatory agency perspectives are and 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 how you develop those kinds of trials because it is a really you know it's a very different kind of approach to to the sort of historical approach that's taken for trials for small molecules so I th that was really interesting. Uh, many times we want uh, readers to really have an ease with how they use the journals. Mm -hmm. We old people, <laughs> we, we PDF everything and print it out, you know, and carry it with us. And if you look in my briefcase, I must have 10 papers PDF'd, you know, that I have marked up. But I find my students don't do that. They read it on the screen. With regards to reading papers, I tend to read the papers either on an iPad or on a computer screen first. And then if I find it to be particularly useful or something that I know I'm going to refer to a lot, then what I do tend to do with those ones is I print them off and I've got a big folder, sort of a, a huge folder full of papers that I'll, I know I'm going to reference a lot or refer to a lot, really. But no, I do find sort of having iPads and using the apps to annotate papers and things is, is more useful. I guess it's more environmental as well. Yeah. Right, you end up printing and throwing it away and then you can never find it again. Yeah, I think on the train, I think particularly, you know, because we travel a bit more with things and stuff, I think I, where I used to probably print out a little stack of things that I would take dedicated to read on the train, now I'll save a whole host of them into it, like a papers apps, mm. you know, on the iPad and then read them. Mm. So I do think, it, I think I've probably changed that respect, but, but I do, st I am still fond of printing them out and <laughs> highlighting bits. <laughs> So one of the things I've found helpful is, is using the, they're called, I think they're RSS feeds. Uh -huh. um, so some of the apps, or one particular one that I use, you can sort of get tables of contents of various different uh, journals and sort of search, searches that you sort of frequently do. And just it brings up all the papers sort of in one, in one app. So you can just sort of scroll through the titles and abstracts, which mm -hmm. is quite a good way of sort of screening papers. So are there some characteristics that you think um, help make a good clinical pharmacologist? I guess we've, we've got to be organized because we're judging, you know, clinical training, research training, and academic and teaching, so organized. Uh, meticulous, I think, you, you know, from the, uh, certainly the clinical trials part and, and our research, but you have to have real attention to detail. I think that's a really important part of what we do is making sure that we don't miss things, particularly when it comes to safety. So yeah, meticulous. I think so uh, alongside that comes sort of a, uh, being having a vision sort of for for how something can go from a from a laboratory concept to something that makes a clinical difference, uh, I think that's a a real privilege to be able to sort of to to be able to be part of that process of happening. And I guess it sounds a bit strange to say, but tough. I think we have to be quite tough in the sense that we're a small specialty and no one really knows knows what a clinical pharmacologist does. And I think you have to be quite strong in yourself and, and, and believe that you you know what you do and that you have a, a, an important role and I think we'll have an, an increasingly important role as, as time goes on so I think you have to be quite confident of, of your position and, and what you bring to the to the clinical service. And I guess we've got to be dedicated you know to get through them you know, you know there's certain experiments that I don't like to run in the lab but we've got to do it to, you know to get the result and it's all worth it at the end but you know, you've got to be dedicated to persevere. So you mentioned that that you have to have a vision and I think that's really true right because I think that one of um, sort of the best benefits of your position is that you still work with patients right so you get to sort of see in real time what their need is and then you get to go and do the research to try and solve that problem where oftentimes if you just work in the lab you don't even know what the need is, you just sort of imagine what it could be and so you go and work in the lab and then if you're only a practicing physician, right, then you take the drugs that other people have really developed and you put them to practice but you sort of bridge that gap mm. from both sides and so I think that's really true, you have to have a vision of both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well I really want to thank Lauren, Stephen, and Vincent for coming and talking with me. I look forward to seeing you at Pharmacology 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.